Good morning. Grace and peace be to you from God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to this online service for First Presbyterian Church in Pilot Mountain on the 23rd of August, 2020. Uh, one announcement is that if you are available to bring uh, a donation for Pilot Outreach, they are looking for snack packs of fruit, applesauce, mandarin oranges, mixed fruit, etc. Those can be placed in the vestibule in the front of the church in the baskets that are there. If you do have your bulletin in front of you, if you would please join me in our call to worship. You who are many are transformed to become one in Christ. We who are many are called to worship God the three in one. Let us worship God. Scripture says that if we say that we have no sin, then we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So let us take this time to confess our sins to God and to each other in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace, too hectic to notice all the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless waste, exploiting what you entrust to our care. We conform to this world's shallow values, oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would now be lost in sin. But it is the Lord who is on our side, and so we are forgiven. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Thanks be to God. And if you would join me for our unison prayer for illumination. God of revelation, mere flesh and blood cannot reveal divine truth. Only your spirit can give that gift. Be in my vo breath and voice, be in our ears and understanding, that through these words your word may be known. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 124. And listen now to the words of the Lord. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And from Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, for as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. And our second reading comes from Matthew chapter 13, or chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. 
Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 2000 and 2001, there was a sensation that swept the nation. It was a game show that had people answering questions with possible answers given in a multiple choice format. The show was, of course, who Wants to Be a Millionaire, with Regis Philbin as the host. It was wildly popular, and many people took up Philbin's trademark phrase, is that your final answer? And sometimes this would cause a contestant, when he asked this question, to pause and wonder if really it was their final answer. Other times there was a confidence that yes, this was their final answer. And many times, Regis would dramatically pause before giving the result of what the contestant had chosen. In that space, there was tension that could be felt in the air. In today's text, there are two questions that are asked. The first question Jesus asks is one that he really knows the answer. The second question is one in which there is tension before and after the question is given and the answer is given. Now first, some background information. What has happened before this text? What is the background of the setting? As everyone knows, a good story narrative must have a good background setting and an understanding of what is going on in an area. Think of any good movie where a backdrop is given to help flesh out the narrative that is occurring. The narrative goes so much more smoothly when there is an understanding of what is going on. And Jesus has taken the disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, this follows the two feedings of the multitudes, numerous healing miracles, Jesus walking on the water as well as Simon's attempt, and being asked by the Pharisees to give a sign of who Jesus is. One might imagine that this little getaway was just that, a time to get away. The region Jesus had, takes them to, though, had worshipped the god Pan since Hellenistic times and was even named Panias by the Greeks. And there is a hidden spring in this city that is the head of a river that is thought to be the river Styx and the entrance to Hades. The city is now named for Caesar and the ruler in Galilee, Philip. There is emperor worship as well as reminders of who is in charge. There are reminders that this is a pagan city all around in the form of temples, shrines, the name, and the river. And none of this would have been lost on Jesus. Never for a minute think that because we might think Jesus was uneducated, that Jesus was not smart and did not know how to make the points he wanted to make. All of this backdrop is to show just who and what Jesus is. And who do the people say that Jesus, the Son of Man, is? And this is the question that Jesus puts to his disciples. Now, the people have seen and heard many things that Jesus has done, as stated above, there are the signs of powers, the feedings, the feedings of the crowds, the healings, the teachings. So the people have a few ideas of who they are looking at here. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, a very popular guest, as Elijah was supposed to bring in the kingdom of God and set all to rights. Jeremiah, as the prophet who spoke of a new covenant, or one of the prophets. Now notice that all the names listed here are no longer with the living. All of these men are dead, except for Elijah, who was taken into heaven in a fiery chariot. If any of these guesses were correct, 
all would have to be raised from the dead. And also notice that no one has the correct answer, even after all that they had seen and heard. No one comes up with the answer that this just may be the one for whom they are looking, the Messiah. Because that would be ridiculous. The Messiah was to come in and bring about the kingdom through military glory. And maybe Jesus is just a forerunner. Whoever he is, the people are flocking to him. And Jesus is really asking a polling question. Who do these people say that I am? And then comes the question Regis would ask for all the money. Now the Greek says, but you, who do you say that I am? This is to all the disciples, as the you here in the text is plural. It would be like Jesus asking to us, Who do y'all say that I am? Simon, impetuous and outspoken, is the one who speaks up. He declares, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, he may have been surprised by his answer, as a contestant would sometimes be, when they just blurted out what they thought was correct and... It was. But Jesus, after maybe looking at Simon for just a moment as if to ask, is that your final answer? States, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Simon got the ultimate lifeline here. This was not anything he had heard or learned from any human source. It was nothing that the people who were following them would have stated. No, this was straight from God the Father, who revealed this to Simon. And that would have explained the surprised look on his face. And the surprise that he wins for this ultimate answer? He is given the name Peter. Now, today this name is so well known that we do not even give it a second thought. But Jesus is making a little joke. The word used is the masculine form of rock, Petra, in the Greek. In other words, Jesus has just named Simon Rocky. Then he tells them that upon this rock, Jesus will build his church or assembly, and that the gates of Hades will not stand against it. And this is the hinge, I like to say, of the text. Here Jesus is letting the disciples know that something is afoot. Now we know that after this, the road that is being traveled leads to the cross. Before this point, it has been a climb up with all good things being seen. And now Jesus is preparing them for the time when he will not be with them. And he begins by telling Simon, now Peter, that he is to be the foundation on which the congregation is to be built. Now, this is not to mean that Peter is to be the beginning of the papacy, or that it was his confession that was the rock. These are two images that have been very popular among the Roman and the Protestant churches and been argued about for centuries. What is being said here is that Peter is to be a foundation. And in Acts, this comes to fruition with Peter giving the sermon that begins the church and later his pioneering the mission to the Gentiles. But with Peter as the foundation, there is one important thing to remember. It is Jesus who will build this church, this congregation, this assembly. The ones who make the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, are the ones who will make up this group that Jesus builds. And it will survive. The gates of Hades, even death itself, will not be able to prevail against it. This assembly will continue wherever people make the confession that Jesus is Lord and Messiah. But there's another aspect of Peter being the rock foundation. Peter is not the person one would assume that God would use to be the foundation of the church. He was impetuous, outspoken, prone to put his foot in his mouth and stumble. But he was also faithful and did his best to follow Jesus. Now, how many of you all have ever seen cairns? These are formations where rocks are stacked on top of one another to form a tower or a pillar. It takes skill and patience to make a cairn because the rocks must be set very carefully to be able to stand in the pillar. Oftentimes, people who are making these just give up as they cannot get them to stand properly. But when they do, it is because they have found the right foundation stone. Peter was rough around the edges and often off balance, like many of the stones used in cairns. 
But Jesus was able to use him as a foundation and then to build the church with the stones that he called to himself, ones that were wobbly and rough, ones that were uneven and with odd edges, ones like the disciples and all of us. So don't put Peter on a pedestal. He would say that as a foundation stone, he needed the patience of Jesus to help the other stones stand. We are called today to answer the question of Jesus, who do you say that I am? The answers are many. He was a good man, a good teacher, one of many who appointed the way to God, a demigod who was created by God, an adopted son of God, and the list goes on and on. But if we are serious about this, then we must depend on the lifeline Peter depended on, the divine revelation that Jesus was and is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, because nothing we could come up with will ever be the correct answer. We need to realize that like Peter, we are stones in an assembly that is built by Christ. Peter would have never said that he had primacy over the other, any of the other disciples. He knew that there was, he was there only by the grace of God, and so are we. And when we are asked by anyone who Jesus is, will we hear the words, is that your final answer? Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning comes from a brief statement of faith, parts 1, 2, and 6. And let us state what we believe. In life and in death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and released to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we turn now to the prayers of the people, I ask that you look on page 6 of our bulletin for those who are on our prayer list. And let us now come together to pray before God. God of all, we thank you for hearing these prayers. For the human family with whom we share this world, those closest to us and those whose names we will never know, we give you thanks and ask your help in living to, into our identity as your children. For the world we share with all creation, the plants and animals we see each day and the wilderness we will never have seen, we give you thanks and ask your help in living into our identity as stewards of your earth. For local, national, and international leaders, those whose policies we appreciate and those with whom we struggle, we give you thanks and ask that you be at their side, guiding them to act in justice and mercy. For joys and concerns that occupy our thoughts today, those we have spoken aloud and those we wonder, ponder inwardly, we give you thanks and ask that you be at our side, guiding us to recognize that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. We hear the prayers we lift in silence. Accept and heed all these prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge. May you see Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see Christ in you. And hear now the blessing. May the Lord who made the heaven and the earth, the Christ who lived and died for all, 
and the Spirit who renews our minds and hearts abide with you and all God's people, now and forevermore. Amen.